swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Oh boy, have I got a story for you on Endurance FM today. If you enjoyed EFM number two, the other week with Graham Ross from Kasagi, you're gonna love the next guest because Graham said that my next guest was as driven and crazy as he was. So what are we gonna learn? We're gonna share power tips and tricks to achieve your goals in business, life, and endurance sports from somebody who's achieved radical change in all those three areas. We're gonna focus on the power of story, how to use accountability, and the importance of hanging around with the right people and getting there. That's all here on Endurance FM in the next hour. Endurance FM. Voice of the Endurance Sports Business. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. My name is Graham Brown. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. And today, buckle up because we are on a ride with a man who's a sports coach. His life has been about breaking through mental barriers. He's a speaker, endurance coach, podcast host, an athlete who recently cycled around Australia. That's about 15,000 kilometers, folks. In two months, he's a plant-based triathlete and Ultraman competitor. Greg McDermott, welcome to the show. G'day, Graham. How are you, mate? I'm fantastic. So where are you today, Greg? I'm uh, sitting in my home in Sydney, Australia, and uh, what are we, about 23 degrees Celsius. Uh, We've struck autumn, mate, so the the nice summer's finished and um, we're going to buckle down now for a hard winter, I reckon. All right, a hard winter in Sydney, right? It's not really a hard winter, is it? Come on. Exactly. As hard as it gets when it's uh, we still have uh, positive numbers in the temperature gauge. Exactly. Well, <laughs> like your good friend, Graham Ross, who was on the show just a couple of weeks back, Australian, you produce a lot of crazy endurance sports athletes. I think with Graham, just to remind everybody, he did the Great Wall Marathon. He's done, I think, nine half Ironmans, four Ironmans. He's moved country, set up businesses, and he has the motorbikes. What is it about you guys down there? <laughs> I think, to be honest, it starts with the climate we've got. We're pretty lucky to um, to live a real outdoors um, lifestyle all year round. And the further north you go, obviously, it gets even better. Um, but I think that sort of starts. I remember when I was a a five or six year old kid coming home from school and it wasn't, you know, can we go out on the, on my, you know, on my push bike in the afternoon, my mum would send us out and say, come back at dark. Um, So it was um, a really uh, interesting uh, upbringing. Like we were sort of always encouraged to explore like what's around and, you know, we got ourselves into a bit of trouble as well, throwing rocks at whatever we could throw them at and all that sort of stuff. But um, I think just the the actual climate just encourages us as um, Australians to get out and explore the world. And I think you see that, you know, wherever you travel in the world, you're always running into a, an Australian that's been backpacking for three years or they're, you know, living in another country. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's a sense of adventure as well. I think with all those creepy crawlies as well, you grow up learning your <laughs> mistakes out there in the wild a little bit. It makes you a bit more, what's the word, resilient. I think that reflects yeah. your older life as well. I mean, you, you're out there doing some crazy adventures now. We'll talk about your business, being an endurance sports coach in a minute. We'll come up to that. I want to talk about Ultraman first. I mean, I'm an Ironman triathlete, and people think about Ironman. The average person looks at an Ironman and think, what the hell is going on? I mean, how do you do it? But Ultraman, explain to us what the hell that is all about. Yeah, so Ultraman is, uh, funnily enough, been around for just about as long as Ironman triathlon. It started in about 1979, I think, uh, on the big island in Hawaii. And and um, it consists, it's a three-day event. It starts with a 10-kilometer ocean swim uh, and a 145K bike day one. And then day two uh, for the Australian race um, is a 275-kilometer bike ride uh, up into the hills in Noosa with about three and a half thousand meters of elevation, wow. and then um, and then day three, just when the legs are sort of screaming out for a rest, there's a double marathon. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, Love so it. I was um, one of 921 athletes in the world now, I think, to ever have completed an right. Ultraman, and and the guys at the presentation informed me that uh, more people have climbed to the top of Everest than have completed an Ultraman anywhere. Is that in the world. true? So, that's Apparently, bad. yeah. So that's a um, good bragging rights. So I'm going to run with that stat. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but how many die on Ultraman? That's the thing, right? Coming back on the last double marathon, you probably want to look at the stat. Yeah, 
To be fair, there's actually a, a really high um, a high finish rate, and I think that's due to a couple of reasons. One, um, we only started in Noosa with a with a group of 45, I think, athletes. Right. Um, because the roads are all open to the public, there's no closed roads, and you've got to have your own crew. They're sort of limited to how many athletes they can have on a course at a particular time. So I think that's one reason. Um, and I think the second reason is that the cutoffs are pretty generous. As hard as those distances sound, you've got 12 hours each day to complete the course. So right. um, I, I literally um, only scraped it through on day three. I, my body, I went hyponatremic on day three and my body was retaining every ounce of fluid that I put into it. So I actually put on about five kilos during the race, which wow. isn't, uh, is not ideal whatsoever. Um, but what it did to me on day three is I did a lot of run walk, obviously, throughout the day. I was the last one to hit the turnaround point, but I actually passed five or six athletes on the way home. So, um, and it, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but it, an event like that is a lot more about your mental state than it is about how fit you are. Um, well, that's you know, what I wanted to ask is yeah. you, you must go through some seriously dark places. In that. Yeah, I mean, you would do yeah. a normal endurance race, right? But in a race like that, you're on your own. You, you. I mean, as you said, you passed guys coming back on the turnaround, but that must have been an exception rather than rule in a race like that with only forty guys running this race. Yeah, well, definitely, and um, I think there's a lot of mental prep um, that goes into that, and and having a really big understanding of uh, why you're out there. You know, why did I choose to do this? Why would anyone? Why would anyone choose to do an event like that? Well, you've got to be able to answer that question to yourself, uh, especially once you go sort of over five and six hours on any given day. You've got to have a really uh, a quick line in your head as to why you're out there. And for me, um, Ultraman for me was the next step after after Ironman. And my why was to, you know, motivate um, and inspire all Australians that, or, and anyone in the world, to be honest, that you can do whatever you want. Um, you know, three years before that, you know, I was 110 kilos. I'd never heard of an event like that. I always had a, an idea that I wanted to do an, uh, an Ironman, but I didn't even know this thing called Ultraman existed um, until I started. I found a guy on the internet um, named Craig Percival, and and I'm um, happy to talk to about him as well. He really um, inspired me to get involved in this ultra endurance stuff as opposed to what I, I term Ironman, probably an endurance sport. Um, I just sort of thought I'll go a bit longer and see what happens. Wow. Well, this is when you were 110K. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, 2013, I weighed 110 kilos. And um, I had a goal that I wanted to do an Ironman for about oh, probably 10 years. I remember going up to the old Ironman Australia when I was in my early 20s and going, wow, that looks amazing. I'd love to do that one day. And I think I watched Chris McCormack win that day and thought, one day I'm going to do that. I didn't even know what the thing was. I just was on Foster, Foster and, uh, for holidays and, and found this event um, and then went on this really uh, destructive journey of um, drinking far too much, eating a really awful diet, uh, not being honest with myself or anyone around me and um, trying to pretend like the old male macho guy that, you know, I was happy, I was healthy and everything was okay, whereas deep down, you know, when you look in the in the mirror in the morning and you discover, you know, I'm not really happy doing this, but I'm going to pretend for another day that I am. Um, but there's there comes a point in your life where you, that sort of everyone around you calls calls you out on the bullshit that you're telling yourself, and that yeah. sort of happened to me. And um, and then eventually I was like, look, I've had enough of this. I need to make a change. So there was this moment you've talked about before where you go to a mate's wedding and you're. I can't remember what some item of clothing it was your vest or whatever. Yeah, that's trying right. To squeeze into it, and it hadn't shrunk. Right, you had grown. <laughs> what, what, what was going on then? Yeah, so I uh, it was my best mate's wedding, and um, six weeks before, you know, you go to the fitting at the you know the suit hire place or whatever, and this vest obviously uh, fitted me fine. And um, the morning of the wedding, I uh, I remember putting the vest on, and I said to my brother who was in the bridal party as well, I said, "Oh, have you got the wrong vest? You know, this one's not fitting." <laughs> Anyway, we worked out that it was it was mine, and and um, I distinctly remember then and there that I said to myself, um, "That's it," you know. And definitely still enjoyed that day and had oh, not too many beers, but I definitely had a good time. And um, 
And I think everyone was quite surprised at the end of the wedding finished, you know, 11.30, 12 o'clock at night that I actually went home with my parents. And and usually I'd be the guy trying to rustle up a crowd, you know, of five or six to head out to the next venue. Um, but I definitely had had enough. And, I, and the next day went to the um, – you know, to the groom's place and had a couple of drinks. They were flying out to Hawaii for their honeymoon. And I literally said to the guys then, I said, look, I'm going to take a break. I've had enough of this. And wow. they all laughed at me. You know, I'd said these sorts of things before. and But it was there was something different then that uh, that really I was like, no, nah, I'm definitely off the drink. I'm not going to – I didn't have a beer for nine months uh, from that day. And uh, one of the things that I, I think it's a really good tip um, for anyone out there who's looking to make a change, I really made myself accountable by making a little bet with my mate. Um, you know, if, if I had a drink over that period of time, I'd give him a thousand bucks. And likewise, if he had a drink, he was going to give me a thousand. And um, I still joke with him today that I, I'm, I really reckon he, after his honeymoon, I'm still sure he had a couple of beers, but that's Speaking. cool. Yeah, but, you know, it's um, there's nothing worse um, in – in my life, I would feel awful if I had to cut a check or make a bank yeah. transfer to my mate for a thousand bucks. I'd yeah, never yeah. hear the end of it. You won't. So, um, yeah, so I put a couple of roadblocks in around myself like that, and I, I really put it out there publicly. Um, I used my Facebook page, to be honest, to to just really put it out there. So when I was at an event, and you know, we all go to events where there's free alcohol or whatever, or or a wedding or whatever. It's like everyone else knew that I wasn't drinking, so it made it a whole lot easier. Um, to say no um, and develop an addiction to sparkling mineral water with lemon rather than beer. So, so you were, yeah. you're kind of reinventing your own story, right? Before yeah. you had this sort of story which you were, you know, you're one of the boys, you like a few beers after football or as you say, 10 or 12 beers after football. I think yep. in your own words, right? You had that and that sort of lifestyle. That's what people knew you as. That's how they related to you. But now you're going out there and telling people what? How did people relate to you then? Did that sort of change the way people thought about you? Did they all get it? Or were people like, oh, I like the old Greg? Yeah, there was uh, funny you say the old Greg. There was actually a Facebook page started at one stage called Bring Back Big Greg. Because um, I, <laughs> no I had a group of mates that, you know, I wasn't the fun guy anymore, but I was personally so much happier, but I wasn't the fun guy to them, you know. I wasn't, uh, you know, taking my shirt off at a, at a pub on a saturday afternoon and being a dickhead i was the you know i was a guy that was uh happier to be out training and running and swimming and whatever else uh doing the uh, at that stage the odd triathlon um and i really um discovered that my social group changed really yeah. quickly um you know i i would hang out with the guys at the gym on a saturday morning for you know coffee and and, uh, and eggs on toast or whatever it may be at the time rather than being hung over on Saturday morning and then going out at 10 o'clock with a different group of people with a hangover and eating bacon and eggs and milkshakes and, you know, whatever else it was. Um, so that was a, a really big change. And there was no, never a negative conversation with any, any of my friends. We sort of just, I went my way and they went their way. So I've really noticed a, a big shift in, mm. in uh, my social group over the last four years. Um, and I'm, I'm massive on the... The idea, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but I've got a very big belief that you're some of the seven people you spend the most time with. Oh, for um, sure. And, you know, that that group has to reflect the person that you are and that you want to be. Um, and, that, and it can often include people that you're obviously helping in your, li in your life to, for them to be better um, and the people that are sort of down the path to where you want to get to that you can sort of aspire to be. So it's really, it's really interesting how that changes. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's tough as well. We'll come to that, that whole idea of your social network and how they influence you and your goals and your outlooks and so on. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the context of your coaching as well, how important that is. There's something in which we can't miss out, which we have to get to first, which is this ride around Australia. And I <laughs> guess it sort of comes into it as well because, you know, Big Greg is now... You know, he, he's doing Ultraman and there's this 15,000 kilometer cycle around Australia, which took you just under two months, right? Uh, yeah, just over. Yeah, to about 10, uh, 11 weeks. It was, All right. Yeah. Okay. So 11 yeah. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. What on earth yeah, so were you thinking? Because this, this wasn't a, a, a race per se. This is something you decided to do, right? Yeah. There was, uh, I, I always had a, along with an Ironman goal, I always had this idea in the back of my head um, 
that I'd love to ride my bike across the Nullarbor, right? It was always this big thing that um, this was 10, 10 years ago or whatever, like, wow, it's the, the straightest roads in Australia and, and possibly the world and um, it's so remote, it's a desert and all this sort of stuff. So I started researching a little bit and I came across a guy in Queensland named Dave Alley who who had ridden around Australia. He'd also run around Australia. Wow. And um, I sort of reached out to him and, and he said, like, Mate, you know, I did the whole thing. As, and then um, he turns out he's a, you know, he's a police officer up in uh, Queensland. He's married. He's got four kids. I'm like, well, if he can do the whole yeah. thing, there's no reason. There's no reason why I can't. Um, and I remember coming home to April, my partner, and I said, um, you know, instead of Perth to Sydney, do you reckon you would you be interested in doing a whole lap? And she's like, a lap of what? And I like sort of quickly explain it to her, and she 100% would backed it straight away. Mm. And uh, I said, all right, well, let's make it happen. Um, so there was a whole lot of, I mean, we learned so much about um, crowdfunding, fundraising, uh, logistics. There was like it was a a whole nine to ten month process before we actually set off from Sydney. Um, and again, I made. Um, made myself really accountable to that goal by simply putting it out there on social media and said, hey, on this date, I'm doing this. Mm. And um, and sort of from then, there was no turning back. And um, obviously, financially, it was really tough. There was a huge amount of money and costs uh, to do the event. Um, plus, the, both of us didn't have a, a dollar of income for three months. So that was, uh, that was pretty tough. Um, but, you know, a lot of people along the way, sort of reached out and, and you know you only live once on this planet so well i believe you do anyway i don't i don't think i'm coming back as a mm. cow a dog or a cat um so my my whole ethos is you've got to get out there every day and chase down your dreams and and that for me was um you know i wanted to inspire people again that you can get out there and and do whatever you want and we also were lucky enough to tie into a charity called uh, youth off the street so we raised a stack of money for homeless youth in Australia. So it was really cool. Fantastic. Really cool. Good for you. What? Who did you do this ride with? Was it with April, your partner? Yeah, so I rode. Um, it's just the two of us. So I rode and um, we, we I'm, I'm not big on the old camping thing. Uh, I'll, I'll put my hand up for that. So we actually hired a camper van. Um, right. So April drove uh, the camper van every day and and was my uh, what? What did she do? She was the the driver, the cleaner, uh, the the dry cleaner, the massage therapist, the the psychiatrist. You right. name it, she did it. Everything. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, and I I genuinely say this. At, at, there was some days out there where she had a tougher time than I did, and it probably took her a little bit more time to adjust to everyday life on the road um, than it did for me. All I had to do was get up at. I mean, I, I say this like it was easy, and it definitely wasn't. But all I had to do was get up, have breakfast, put my riding gear on, and get out on the bike. Um, and she had all the other, you know, she sometimes I'd leave the like I'd leave the van, and she'd say, "Oh, the hurricane's off," you know, because the van had been an absolute mess. Um, you know, after three months on the road, I still to this day didn't know which cupboard the peanut butter was in. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> so it was. She's like, "How can you not know that?" You know, so. There was a whole load of um, stuff that that she did that went definitely unnoticed, um, not from me, but by you know a lot of people out there. That that I, I used to say to her, I can't do this ride without you, but you can definitely do what you're doing without me. So without her, I, I I definitely couldn't have even started it. So yeah, it was amazing to have that support. You talk about making yourself accountable as well. How important was that in achieving your goal? Because you did it for this ride, you did it for Ultraman, and also giving up the the booze, right? Yeah, it's a kind of a high risk strategy as well, isn't it? You're you're putting yourself out there, and you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. Is that necessary? You know, is that a good way? Isn't there a better way of doing it? A nicer way of doing it for yourself? Because you, you're beating yeah. yourself up if you fail, right? Yeah, um, touch wood, I haven't failed at anything yet I've put out there. Um, but for me, it works and it's different for every person. Now, I'm, uh, I've am i definitely got, uh, let's let's call it for want of a better term, I, I've got a bit of an addictive personality. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm one in, I'm all in um, with everything I do. Now, whether that was drinking alcohol or gambling or 
doing triathlon or riding my bike. I'm if I'm in, I'm in. If I'm out, I'm sort of wishy washy. It's not going to happen. Um, but to put it out there publicly for me uh, just stops me from failing, and I and and that works for me. It, it, that definitely won't work for everyone. Um, but I think uh, I've actually seen a few people around me and that have now sort of ad- adapted that sort of strategy as well. Now, whether that's from me or from someone else, it, it doesn't really matter. That obviously works for them. Um, so I think everyone's different. Uh, you know, some people I, some of the guys I coach now, no one in their lives apart from me really understands the goal that they want to achieve and that works for them. Um, or, you know, I've got a really good mate in Melbourne and, and he doesn't say a word, but you'll see him pop up in an Ironman and he'll, he'll win his age group. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So he's obviously, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I think uh, intrinsic motivation is where you need to be and I've definitely got a big dose of that. Um, but I do use um, the external motivation of um, tying in other people or, you know, putting it out there publicly or for the ride, um, tying in a, a charity that I was then, you know, responsible for. So, you know, I had uh, a big sign um, that I made up when I left the van every time I left the van, which some days was up to five to six times. It just said why with a question mark. Um, and I had to answer that there was two reasons. You know, I, I wanted to raise as much money as we could for the charity and there's a whole heap of kids relying on that. Um, and the second reason was to motivate anyone in the world that you can achieve whatever dreams you sort of set out to do. So in my own head, I was then responsible for everyone in the world. Do you know what I mean? And that puts yeah. a big burden on your shoulders, um, but it makes uh, the tough times a little bit easier. Um, so when I'm out there, you know, I had days where I, my average speed was 14 kilometres an hour. You know, we had 50 kilometre headwinds for 12 hours. Wow. Um, so, you know, that can be very daunting when you leave the van at 5 a.m. in the morning and I'm I'm a big maths nerd, um, so I, I have a very quick comprehension of how many hours it's going to take me to cover 150 or 200 kilometres. Um, so it's like, okay, well, I just got to dial in here and ride one more kilometre because otherwise I'm letting down all these people. Um, so that really that really works for me, throwing it out there. Um, but as I say, that, that, that might not work for everyone. So I'm always big on try it. Just try something else. You know, if something doesn't work, try something else. Um, well, it's a fascinating way of putting it. I, I wonder as well, would we endurance sports athletes, we're involved in a business, a discipline, which is quite self-absorbed, isn't it? You know, it's it, in a way, you know, I'm going to go out and train now and it's your time. Mm. Often the best training is alone, you know, and whether it's in the pain cave on the, the trainer on the bike or you know, yep. going out running on your own. It's, it's your time. And as a result, other things have to take second interest. So in a way that why question that you ask, Greg, I wonder if that sort of brings it back to making it not about you, but about other people. And that totally. makes it more motivating because, you know, if it's just a sort of a selfish goal, which I'm following because I want to do this, it's, it's fine. You can get to the end of the line with that. But now you've mm. made it about other people. It's sort of, in a way, you, you can dig deeper and find more of motivation because, you know, you have more of a purpose, isn't it? You're here to yeah. do something and, I don't know, make a difference, I suppose. Yeah, and you're right. The exact word you hit on there was purpose. And um, that's if, – if you've got a – if you set yourself a goal without a real intrinsic motivator behind it, well, it's just it's just words on a page or it's words on a Facebook page, but – you need to be able to answer the re- – and I, I think we've spoken about it twice now. You need to know why you're doing these things. Um, and it's not even about um, just doing these endurance sports activities like, you know, riding your bike around Australia or Ultraman or whatever. Um, you can bring it back to an everyday situation of why you're getting up to go to work, you know. And we see this – I see it every day. I'm like – you see people that are, you know, they're earning really good money but they're totally unhappy um, with what they do and it's like you're spending – up to half of your waking hours of your life doing something that you don't want to do. Um, so, and I think a lot of the way we've been conditioned now, um, I, I think in a capitalist society is that, you know, we're sort of conditioned to get a job, work hard, get a mortgage, work even harder, get married, have kids, retire, pass away, leave it to your kids. And, um, 
I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and that's sort of the path because I've thought about it. It's if, if everyone actually thought about it and in that way, I don't think a lot of people would do what they genuinely do on a daily basis. Mm. So we don't ask why to ourselves. We don't get the time. We don't, we're sort of surrounded by noise, aren't we? And that sort yeah. of makes it difficult for us to think these why questions. Is that why mm. you then became an endurance sports coach? So that's your full-time job. You coach athletes. What, what is the why behind that for you? Um, I've got to, I post uh, doing a few Ironmans and then obviously through Ultraman, I started getting a lot of um, people asking me for help. And um, now I attract two different distinct two very distinct um different levels of athlete i've got um you know athletes that i coach at the moment that are in excess of 120 kilos and have got a goal to do a marathon um and definitely uh new to new to endurance sport and things like that and i also coach athletes that are let's say 20 to 25 years of age who are at the top end of the sport um, and are looking for the extra edge to to win um, but what I found was, and, and when I started researching a lot of even professional athletes and things, they always had a big driver and that's how they won. Um, so I'm, I'm a big believer in it doesn't matter what sort of talent you've got, the ones who end up winning are the ones that work harder. Um, and I think my coaching ethos is not about um, going out and smashing athletes and all that sort of stuff. And I'm really big on resting and recovery and all that sort of stuff um, it's more about how do you mentally feel um, on a daily basis and all of my guys um, and girls that I coach I'm always asking them on a scale of one to ten how do you feel physically and how do you feel mentally and it's amazing that the mental number if I graphed it the mental number is so much different you know it could be a three to an eight let's say or a three to a ten or a one to a 10, whereas the physical ones always between, let's say, a five and a seven or a five and an eight. Um, so that's sort of how it sort of was born out. And I literally just started helping people for free. I used to run a free running group. Um, and then that's, we grew that and, and, um, and it was, you know, the reason I started coaching for free was that everyone told me what barriers they had to achieving their goals. And the first one always seemed to be finance. Um, finance and time they were the two so i said all right well i'll coach i'll run these two running sessions for free on a weekly basis all you have to do is show up april even used to knock up a breakfast half the time for the people that came down <laughs> and um and then i was like well you know we're growing and there's a, a few more people coming down but i sort of attracted people that were already on the same page as us as opposed to i wanted to attract the people that you know, was was lying in on a on a weekday morning instead of getting up. But mm. I realized very quickly that I couldn't determine what their goals were. I couldn't determine their mindset. They had to do that themselves. So um, it's funny when you sort of delve into a market that you really want to help people of where I was in 2013. You, I, you know, it's an old saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. And there's, it doesn't matter what you tell someone or you know, what you can show them until they see that spark themselves, that's when they ring and they ask for help. Um, so that's sort of really been a big learning curve for me that I have to wait until people are ready, um, which is hard because I'm like, I can really help this person or I, I really see potential in what they can do. But until they're ready, they, they, they just don't get on board. Was it a natural progression into coaching for you? Because you talk about setting up this running group and doing yeah. it for free and, you know, your partner giving away free breakfasts and all this kind yeah. of thing, right? I mean, it's a big investment of your time and, you know, your heart basically into something where, you know, you could you could do it differently, you know, go and get some clients straight off the bat and, you know, get yeah. paid. Why did you do it like that? Um, for a, uh, Probably the main reason was I just wanted to help. Uh, that was, you know, I had another source of income at the time, so income wasn't the big determining thing for me, but... It's really um, what's changed for me since like post Ultraman is that people actually, I believe, have respected me more as a coach and a mentor when I've asked them for money, um, which has been a very big learning curve, actually. So and then it's like, OK, well, how do we then uh, monetize uh, financially? Because I think I, I mentioned to you before, I 
you know, a, a statement I've stolen off a couple of people is you can't live off love hugs and pixie dust. Um, so you need to have some some income coming in so you can sort of get out there and help as help more people. Um, so when we sort of transitioned it to a in inverted commas business, um, it was really interesting to see that more people came forward and said, "I'd love you to coach me," or "I'm thinking about doing an Ironman," or "Do you think I can do an Ironman?" or "Do you think I can, I've got what it what it takes to be a triathlete?" Um, and my answer is genuinely always a yes. Um, and but the questions that go with that are: Are you prepared to get out of bed at five o'clock in the morning when it's in the middle of winter, or are you prepared to change your diet, or are you prepared to you know, may, possibly, are you prepared to change the partner that you hang around? Because if you're not prepared to make those sacrifices and changes, then the goal's just sort of going to float out there. And that's what it did for me for eight, nine years. It just floated and floated and floated until I realized that I needed to make some drastic changes in my life to be able to action it. Yeah. That part about, we're coming back to it, that part, but I think it's so important, the social part of all of this and then we touched on it as well about the why question and so on mm. but you've also mentioned it with your bike round around the uh around australia doing the fifteen thousand k you know doing that with april and also talking about the the chap that you mentioned dave alley you know that you reached out to yep. and i guess that was in a way kind of made it a bit more real for you how important the people you hang around with are not just uh, you know as a coach but you know for the people that you coach and you're talking about these changes that people may have to make some serious changes in their lives that they want to get ahead when you coach people in those situations they want to move forward but they see their social network as holding them back mm. how do you deal with that because that's a really tough decision isn't it i mean maybe these I people see. aren't saying no don't do that don't do that but they're not just sort of being supportive are they yeah, and that's it's a bloody hard one, mate. And it's uh, it's it's tough. You gonna if when you go through a change like this, like my entire social network of friends, family, and everything. No, I shouldn't say family, but friends <laughs> uh, in particular has changed dramatically. And it, it's not that I rang anyone and said, you know what, we're not going to be mates anymore because <laughs> I'm doing this. You're right. Um, yeah, exactly. And there was never a conversation like that, although subconsciously. I think I've put myself into those, um, sorry, extricated myself from those situations. Yeah. So, you know, April and I often ask ourselves a question, you know, you, we get invited like anyone, you get invited to a, events throughout your life. And it's like, is going to that event going to either have a positive effect on getting towards my goals or is it going to have a negative effect? And genuinely, if we can answer that question and mm -hmm. it's a no, we don't go. And it's, um, you know, there's been a, a couple of situations that we're in our mid-30s now, so we're starting to get 40ths or even 50ths coming up. Um, and it's like, well, that's on a Saturday night. Um, there's going to be, it's going to be a, a, the usual drink up. I'd rather catch up with that person and have a coffee with them at a later time hmm. because at 4.30 tomorrow morning, my alarm's going off and I'm either going to a race to support my athletes or we're going training or whatever it may be. So, um and I think uh, what I did really well was I always put uh, book sessions in to do at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. on weekend mornings. Um, so it was always an easy conversation while I was at an event to say, right. look, I'm going to head off because I've got to be up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock because I'm doing a 100K ride or I'm going to run a half marathon or whatever it may be. Um, but definitely um, my firm belief is that you are a sum of the seven people you spend the most time with and or the sum of the people that you the seven people that you allow to have the biggest influence on your life so if they're genuinely positive people and they're going to drag you towards your goal guess what you'll make it if they're if they're going to be having a negative have a negative effect on your life and and sort of tracking down your goals well you're probably going to end up where they are and if that's for me if that was you know, the pub on a Saturday afternoon betting on racehorses and all that sort of stuff, that's where I ended up? Or is it going to be the seven people that are at the triathlon club on a Sunday morning setting up transitions and picking up fruit and all that sort of stuff? Is that mm. the sort of people you want to hang around? So, yeah. And you make those – You, you there comes a point in your life where you sort of make those decisions and, um, you know, you just sort of got to move forward with it. And 
and believe that you're doing the right thing for yourself, your family, and your partner. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Very good advice. And I imagine as well for the people that you coach, this is something that they have to go through. And for some people, it's easy. Some people, it's a lot more difficult. But the coach as well is part of the the people that they hang around with, I suppose. You know, if the, the coach is influencing the athlete, then that coach is one of those seven people effectively, right? And that's the positive totally. impact, right? Because if you're yeah. if you're hanging out with somebody who's effectively saying, you can do this, you know, I've done this, I've gone from here mm -hmm. to here, you know, what you're trying to achieve is similar, then it becomes possible, right, for that person. Yeah, at 100%. And that's like a lot of uh, my work as a coach. Yeah, definitely I, I write, write programs for all my athletes, but a more important part that I help them out in their lives is – self-belief, um, motivation, definitely, um, and and being the person that believes 100% in the goal that they're going to achieve. Mm. So, and people like, you know, I'm obviously not going to name any names, but there's a lot of people I've worked with in the past that are, you know, you really want to say, look, the number one reason, that, the number one thing that's holding you back in your life from what I can see is your partner. Um, but that's not a conversation that, you know, you want to be having yeah. <laughs> with, with an athlete. Um, definitely look, if I'm asked, I'll, I'll be honest and I'll tell them. Um, but it's, um, it's, you know, I'm not a, a qualified psychologist. Um, so all I can do is, or a diplomat. Uh, totally. Yeah. And I, so I coach off my experience, exactly. um, you know, I'm definitely qualified and all that sort of stuff, but you know, um, a good coach, uh, you know, we see it in rugby league in Australia, the best players don't always make the best coaches. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, Definitely one of our the best coaches, and I've, I've read a lot about him and and followed him for quite a long period of time is Wayne Bennett, and mm. he was never like a an A level rugby league player, but he's the best coach in the country, and and he he um he says his ethos is I coach the man, not the player, mm. um and there's a lot of those sort of conversations that happen as a coach that are more about how do you mentally feel today and why is that as opposed to why wasn't your heart rate in zone six for right, 45 right. minutes? You know, yeah. so it's a, I'm more interested in the athlete uh, coming back from a session with a smile on their face, ready for the next session, as opposed to worrying about whether they hit the numbers. Yeah. So, no, that's yeah. so true. I want to take that conversation into the context of one of the things that you do, one of the, you know, you go out and you talk to kids, you get invited yep. into schools, real wide age range you know from very young all the way up to you know i guess pre-university and having that kind of conversation tell us about that because i know you do a lot of work you do i mean you've done the 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 support of the kids charities for your rides but you actually go in and talk to these people in the school and this is a part of what you do to help these kids how is that like because you're not coaching an endurance sport athlete you say right this is my goal i want to complete iron man and i want to do it in 10 and a half hours you, you, yeah, these people yeah. are open and like you know why do I want to run or you know how is that like for you? Yeah, it's um it's a total of different conversation to start with, and but it comes back to the same thing, and it's you know dream big, you know get out there and get after it, you know, and it's it's funny when you um when you take a time trial bike into a primary school and um, you start to talk to kids. First of all, they see the bike and they're like, what the hell is that thing? It doesn't look <laughs> like my BMX. Um, and then you start to, you know, just just tell them a bit about what you've done and and um, and you've got to be a little bit more diplomatic, if you like, in a school. There's definitely no swearing and it's a lot softer. Yeah. Um, but you can get to the kids to the same point of, of thinking. You can really see it in their eyes, you know. You show them a short video clip or, or some photos of how remote Australia is or whatever it may be. And you can nearly see them start to think, you know, either, geez, I'd love to do that, or they start to think a bit bigger. And, um, you know, that you'll have a, the odd kid come up to you after a session and say, you know what, I really want to be an NRL player, like in our, our national rugby league competition. And they're, you know, a 14-year-old kid. And, and deep down, I know that that's not the message that's being sent at home. Like, so I'm like, 100%, let's do it. You know, what if you... What are the steps you've got to take in the next six weeks to be able to make that a reality? And then what about the next six months and what do you want need to be doing next year? And it's like these kids have never been challenged and asked those questions. So, you know, at home it, it's always um, – well, not always. At, at times it's always about have you done your homework? Um, why did you do that at school? No, you can't do that. And I want to really encourage kids that – 
they can dream as big as they like. You know, if they want to be an astronaut, there's no reason why they can't be. And, you know, but also taking some action around that and saying, okay, if you want to be an astronaut, what are the things you've got to do? You know, and the, and and I ask kids this, and they and the and I in the past I've had the answer. Oh well, I need to I need to study really hard. It's like no no no. You need to go to the library over there, and you need to just it's free. Just get on the internet for half an hour and find four astronauts and just read their story. You yeah, know, and yeah, so and true. then you were you know, and as they get to high school level, that becomes a lot easier because they're all on social media. So it's like okay, well why don't you add in, like, just just add the guy that's been an astronaut or, you know, add the guy. For me, it's like I've got school kids that follow me on social media that want to ride around Australia. I've got a couple of kids like that. You know, they want to do what I did, which is really cool and humbling. Um, and it's just about, you know, just encouraging them along the way with a comment here or, you know, a private message or whatever it may be and just say, hey, well done, you know, keep yeah. going or um, – and I don't ever have to meet these people. It's just a matter of, you know, hopefully they, hopefully I can, if I can encourage one person to change the trajectory of their life to being more positive as opposed to negative, well, I'm, I'm more than happy. I'm sure um, you will have done already. You, you'll be that guy, I, you know, when, when these kids grow up, Greg, you know, if any of these become successful, they're going to have that conversation. Yeah, I was at school and this guy came in and showed me his bike and, <laughs> That planted the seed. I mean, that has an impression upon these kids, right? You, you know, you don't have to meet that person ever again, but you planted a seed in their head. And of course, 90% of them won't get it. But for the yeah. 10% who want it, you were there at the right time. You planted that seed and that just grew. And then, you know, yeah, totally. 10, 15, 20 years later, that blossomed into whatever it is now today, right? Yeah, and it's funny. I've I've had that in my life. Like only over the last couple of years, you know, I reached out to a guy on the internet named Craig Percival and spoke to him about about Ultraman, and um, and he he founded Ultraman. He brought the race to Australia, and um, I didn't go the first year, and it took me another year to sort of get ready for that. So he sort of motivated me to do that. But the reason I I found any I even discovered Ultraman to start with. I just started listening to Rich Roll's podcast, right, yeah. and um, you know, my massage therapist said, "Hey, this guy Rich Roll, you know, you should listen to him." So I started listening, and he's talking about this race and and how he was overweight, and you know, he had a problem with alcohol and and drugs and whatever else. And I'm like, "Hey, if he can do it, I can do it," you know. And and that, when I look back at those sort of decisions now, I was just choosing to be influenced by um, people in my in that have, have been successful in those areas. Now, I've never met Rich. Um, I may not ever meet him, but he's had a direct influence on my life mm. um, by simply downloading a podcast that's free. Yeah, no, so. it's great as well. I mean, he's a fantastic being. And, and he's also a, a plant-powered triathlete like you, right? I he sure is, yeah. Did, did yeah, that another, sort of have any yeah. kind of influence on you as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, and again, I'll go back to you know my massage therapist, Dave. He was talking to me about you know he said to me one time i remember a couple of years ago or maybe three years ago he said oh you know i've been doing this vegetarian thing for a while i'm like oh really tell me more about that and uh my dad's irish you know i was brought up on meat and three veg and, and yeah. one of those veggies was potatoes every night you know <laughs> um so uh so it started having a conversation and i came home to april one day and we were sort of obviously we we're eating really well at the time you know we we're eating a whole food diet anyway we weren't you know, going through the Macca's drive through or anything like that. Um, and I said to her, look, I think I'm going to try this thing for three months and see what happens. And sure enough, I I noticed I was um, – my performance was better. I was recovering better. And, and then so we did the vegetarian thing for probably about two years. And then, you know, I, I met a guy at a – again, just putting yourself in the right environment. I uh, met a guy in Sydney named James Aspie, and, and he's a um, – let's say an, em an animal liberationist is probably how he'd want to be termed. And he's, he's plant-based and wasn't always, but is now. And, and he sort of, April and I spoke to him after an event he held and just saying, you know, we've been veggie for a few years. And he sort of just stopped and he's like, why don't you just take the next step? You know, like just cut out the dairy and the eggs and whatever. I'm like, okay, well, we'll give it a crack. And, um, and it hasn't been a terribly, look, we're still alive. It hasn't been a terribly hard transition. Um, and it, we do still um, at times struggle in Sydney when we're out, especially at an event or something. So you do have to plan a little bit better as, as to what you have to eat. Um, and we do refer to ourselves as, as 
um, having a plant-based lifestyle uh, because I do have a sponsor in, uh, that, that helps me out with all my nutrition that uses honey in some of their products. So it's sort of a, 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 an ongoing transition, you know, and I, I still say to people, you know, I've, I've got leather seats in my car, but I've had the car for five years, you know, right. so it's, I'm not going to sort of throw everything away, but when the time comes to make a decision on something else, I'll, um, I'll make that decision based around my, my current beliefs. Um, and um, I think for endurance sport, you know, Rich is sort of the pinup boy for uh, plant-based nutrition. And now there's a, there's a few Ironman guys and girls at the top end of the sport that are plant-based. Um, so it's starting to sort of gain a bit more momentum um, to lead a, a really healthy life, uh, be conscious about the environment and the world we live in as well. Yeah, good for you. Hey, so let's, let's finish up. There's one thing I want to talk to you about, Greg, and it's something that you've written. I'll paraphrase you now because I don't have the exact words in front of me. Something like, if your goals aren't scaring you, they ain't big enough. Yep. <laughs> so I'm going to turn that back on you now, Greg, because this is your chance. Yep. I, don't want, I know you've got a habit of committing yourself in public. So you've got to be careful what you say. Like, I don't want to yeah. push you into something that you have to go down this rabbit hole for the next two years. But what's scaring you at the moment in terms of your goals? Uh, so goals-wise, um, I definitely want to go back. Uh, I think I, I've got unfinished business with Ultraman. Um, now, whether that be in Australia, I'd also love to compete at the Ultraman World Championships. Um, so that's sort of that's sort of sitting there at the moment. Um, and then... And I do have a goal to get back to running properly. Um, now, riding a bike around Australia for, for three months and sort of training for that event since May last year has sort of meant I haven't run a lot. Um, so I'm working on getting a goal together for December this year to do something a little bit out of the box um, and it'll really challenge me in relation to running. I'm probably not ready to share that yet because I want to nail it down. You'll be the yeah. first to know though, mate. <laughs> Um, so, but I do have that belief if you you know, if your goal doesn't, you know, make the hair stand up on the back of your neck a little bit, or, or you're sort of like a little bit anxious about it, I probably would say that it's, it's probably not big enough. Um, I've, you've probably read in the same sort of article that, um, that I've probably written there that. I've got this firm belief that we're moving all the time in, in the world and you're either moving one way, you're either moving forwards or you're moving backwards. So if you're not growing, you're sort of, you know, you're not, you're going backwards. And I often speak to a few, uh, a few older people that are more mature people, I should say that um, like this whole move it or lose it mentality, you know, and um, I look at uh, people that are my parents age and, you know, they're hitting 70 and, you see people that they've sort of been around now for 20 to 30 years in their lives that are, you know, they're going to funerals. Mm. And it's like because that's a direct reflection a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time it's a direct reflection of how they've lived their life up to that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think you, it's like a move it or lose it. You've got to be growing. Um, I've definitely got a growth mentality. Um, so you've got to get out there and, set something for yourself that's a little bit challenging. It doesn't have to be anything as stupid as riding a bike around Australia or, you know, doing a – there's a couple at the moment doing a 100 Ironmans in 100 days oh. in Sydney. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that. But if it's um, – let's take it down to a real easier scale. If you want to um, – not even on a physical level, if you want to learn another language, well, make a decision to do something tomorrow that's going to get you towards that goal. You know, it might be – uh, just getting online and, and Googling where you're going to learn how to do this. Um, because if you keep thinking about it and don't take any, any action, nothing will ever happen. Yeah. I love what you just said there. Make a decision. How important that is, right? That's the first step. Because it just that making a decision is a commitment, isn't it? And that is sometimes the hardest things for people to do. Whether it be 100 Ironmans in 100 days or losing weight, or just getting healthier, or learning a language, whatever it is, just that making a decision. That word itself, decision, comes from the Latin to cut. And in a way, you right. know, yeah, your story yeah. itself is embodiment of that. You cut, you know, that past in a way, you know, the bad habits out. So right, I've cut that thread in my life now, and I'm moving on. Yeah, totally. Starting, you know, how powerful that is. Yeah. And, and importantly, how powerful the people around you are in helping you make that decision. 
Greg, it's been a real inspiration. Yeah. Your story is an inspiration. I've really enjoyed learning about your story. And I really you know, appreciate you coming on and sharing it with us, the listeners here today. Where can we find out more about you? Um, probably, oh, first of all, mate, thank you so much for uh, for your time. It's I love being able to talk to as many people in the in the on the globe as as we can. Um, so thanks so much for sharing the story as well, mate. So, but um, if people do want to uh, contact me, I am the guy behind the website. Um, I will answer your emails. It's not a it's not a or someone else. So. Uh, my website is gregmcdermott.com.au. Um, you can feel free to contact me there any way you like. Um, and then on Facebook, just search Greg McDermott and you'll see uh, uh, a couple of pages pop up. Feel free to add either of them in. Awesome. We'll put all the details in the show notes. And Greg, yeah, come back six months, 12 months. I know you've got something, a project, which is not yet <laughs> public, I know it. I feel it. You've got something to share to put out into the public, the, the world, and share with. <laughs> make a commitment, Greg. Do it for us. Come back in six or twelve months, mate. I'll promise. Point. I'll 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 promise you this. In uh, in six months' time, we'll do it all again. And yeah. um, who knows where we'll be? I could be living in another country or anything. But uh, <laughs> I'll definitely um, have something for you, mate. Absolutely. I oh, love it. I look forward to that. That's Greg McDermott, everybody. Speaker, endurance coach podcast host as well go and check out his podcast athlete who's done some well incredible adventures the 15,000k around Australia Ultraman there's unfinished business there as well maybe we'll talk about that in a future podcast as well as being a plant-based triathlete Greg McDermott thank you very much for coming on the show thanks Greg Endurance FM voice of the endurance sport business find out more at www.endurancefm.com